Hello, it's Jake here, and welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion about Lysander Spooner's book, No Treason. And it's really more of a recommendation um, than an in-depth discussion. This book uh, is something that I only discovered relatively recently, and it is a wonderful book. It's really something that, if you have had um, discussions with people about the social contract... Um, and about your obligations to society, whatever that is, and you've thought about what that might mean, you might notice that the terms used in discussions about the social contract are kind of legal terms, a contract, for example. And reading Spooner's book, No Treason, is really like reading something from your lawyer. Uh, Spooner was a lawyer himself, and this book is sort of a legal assessment of all of these claims that have been made about your obligations. This is your lawyer telling you whether or not you have to take this seriously. The book was written in the 19th century, and it's a critique of the American Constitution, which, I mean, if you are interested in the idea of limited government, the American Constitution itself is often considered to be, you know, one of the best examples of a written constitution defining separation of powers and this, that and the other. So reading this critique of one of the clearest constitutions or social contracts is very applicable to every other state, which um, has even less clear constitutions. In the case of the UK, um, no, no written constitution. So the book itself really helps think about what the idea of your obligations to the state as a citizen are and whether or not those are legitimate claims and what the nature of those claims of your obligations are. So in this discussion, we talk about some of the ideas in the book, but I really recommend reading it. Um, it's, a, it's a great read, and you can find it for free online in both uh, text and audiobook format. So thank you so much for listening and hope you enjoy the discussion. This is basically an excellent argument against the social contract, is what I see it as. Yes. It was really useful to read from a standpoint of, um, when he, like, in the very first bit, when he's talking about, like, this is a totally valid contract for the people who lived in this area and the people who signed it, right? (laughs) Right, right. But you can't extrapolate that to people who didn't sign it, and then you sure as hell can't extrapolate that to people a hundred years later. Absolutely, yeah. I thought it was just great the way he went through all of the kind of concepts that people use to leg- legitimize government through this, the idea of social contracts. So, for example, like you say, the idea that it could be a contract, and he points out no one signed it, and there's no way you can hold people who've never had anything to do with signing it um, responsible. But then the thing that I also thought was great was he talks about voting. Yeah, I was going to bring up Section 3, voting, or yeah. Section 2. Like... That was awesome. That was so cool, the way that he points out that... Because like, he keeps, all the way through, he keeps reiterating that government is a secret band of robbers and murderers. Uh-huh. And then when he talks about the fact that people vote in secret and how, like, that, that itself... Like you ought to, you you know that that should make you wonder, like what kind of fishy fishiness is going on? Because I I remember, you know, the idea that oh well, you know, secret ballot is so that you don't get um, you know bullied into voting one way or the other. But he's pointing out that there's no way that anyone in the government could ever say that they represent anyone because they don't know who voted for them. They can't point to them. There's no contracts. It's not like there could ever be a valid contract between the voters and the representatives of government anyway, because there's this kind of bizarre secret um, crossing your name in a, in a booth thing going on. And then obviously all the arguments about it's, it's, never, um, it's never actually, you know, um, everyone voting for it anyway. It's a, a kind of random bunch of people and different, different people each year and, but I, I just really like that um, that emphasis that he has on on the people who do uh, vote for the state, treating it as essentially that they are essentially a secret band of robbers and murderers. I thought that was great. Yeah, I mean the, that section, the voting section, but just like concise argument after concise argument, rather than 
just a bunch of history. Like, you read a lot of these libertarian books, and it's just a bunch of historical facts. And you read a lot of these libertarian books, and it's just, like, one big, grand, unifying theory. And this guy didn't do either approach. But as Andrew Spooner didn't, he, it was, like, a lot of concise arguments that built up to one large argument, but it wasn't, it was, it was, it was a modest book, and I think that's really good. Well, I thought it was, um, the, the, the things that I really enjoyed, he makes two, like, he, he kind of attacks it on two grounds. One is that he, he really does say there is no such thing as the state, and that there are no, there's no such thing other than individuals. And I've listened to a podcast by um, Wendy McElroy. Oh, really? Yeah. She is fantastic. She's great, yeah. And she's done a really interesting one about the 19th century um, individualist anarchists. And she says that one of the things about them that was really good was that they were very much um, methodological individualists. And that, that term meaning that they only accepted that any social theory has got to be about people, individual people. You can't start appealing to some kind of, you know, concept because concepts don't really exist. And this is obviously what Steph keeps saying as well. And the other point that he makes, which I think is really cool, is that he goes full on with the argument for morality and he just absolutely digs right in there. I mean, the fact that he keeps using... You know, he keeps directly calling them a band of robbers and murderers. It's just so cool. I, when I was reading it, it was like, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> calling it by its real name. And, and I would be, I would love to hear more about Spooner's personal life. Like, like I would love to read a, bio, a good biography of Spooner because he seemed like a really interesting cat. Like, um, he, uh, like he, you heard about his post office endeavor, right? Yeah, that he decided to take on the post office. Yeah, and then they just completely shut him out. Amazing, amazing. And I get the sense that, um, oh, by the way, the, um, the, if you want a, a good biography, the one that's on, the, um, the one that um, Jeff Riggenbach did, that podcast on him, have you heard that? Uh, no, I haven't. That would on, be cool, though. Yeah, on the Libertarian Heritage thing, there's um, a podcast by good old Jeffy Boy um, where he talks about Spooner's... Spooner's life, and it, it is fascinating. I mean, the guy was like a total swashbuckler. I mean, he was constantly like doing things like setting up a post office to to compete with the um, with the state system in order to demonstrate that it was crap, and it really worked. And that's why they shut him down. And he also he um, he qualified as a lawyer. Like he was, and an, he came from a, like a pretty poor background, but co- somehow got taken in by I don't, know, I can't remember what it was, like some uncles or something like that. And essentially, he he got somebody noticed that he was really bright, and he was kind of like I think he was like an assistant in a legal office or something when he was in his when he was like a, a, a kid, a teenager, and basically he learned to become a lawyer and trained, and he. he he was able to practice by the age of, I don't know, 21 or 22 or something like that. But they had some kind of stupid um, protective law in place in Massachusetts that you weren't allowed to be a lawyer until you'd done like, I don't know, 10 years this or six years that or whatever. And so he went and challenged the um, the kind of um, the guild or whatever and the effectively the loyally trade union for the right to practice at his age. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, the guy was constantly attacking mercantilism and statism. And, of course, he was an abolitionist. And he was like, really clear on, on, um, on the, the horrors of the American Civil War and the immorality of, of, um, of the hypocrisy of, uh, of what the North was saying it was about. As you saw that in, in No Treason as well. So I think the guy was really interesting. I don't really know, you know, what... I don't know the background of, like, did he have a family and how did that kind of thing work? But um, certainly in his kind of career life, he was just like a total swashbuckler. And not only that, but apparently the individualist anarchists were great experimentalists like this. Like, Spooner set up his own post office. And one of the other ones, I don't know if it was Tucker, I think it was one of the other ones, um, actually set up a shop where he was trying to prove the labor theory of value because unfortunately they were a bit 
hung up on the labour theory of value, these 19th century individualist anarchists. They thought that lending money for interest was wrong. Um, and this guy set up a shop where you exchanged labor dollars, which brought you an hour of time in somebody else's profession. And he did all of this, like, basically to try and prove his theory. So they were, they were at least great experimenters, you know. They were actually trying to, to do it in their own life to show that it works, you know what I mean? Right, right. I guess, it, you know, because the postal service was effectively the, the internet of the day, you know. So you, you, it'd be kind of stupid to try and set up a, a postal service now, but in, in that time, it would be like him setting up um, a, um, an encrypted file sharing service or something like that. You know, right, right. That makes sense. The thing I was going to just mention was, I mean, I, I really enjoyed the moral clarity of it. I really enjoyed the um, the fact that he point had such philosophical clarity as well. I think it's really well written, and I think it's also got a great sense of um, of humor. Or I mean, I don't know if humor is really the right word, but just it's just a, a really spiky text. You know, it's kind of kind of a pleasure to read because because he's spot on and he has absolutely no fear about um, just stating his arguments completely s- sort of squarely. You know, he doesn't mince his words, and I enjoy that. Right. Um, but I did find the uh, the last chapter was kind of a uh, little bit of a letdown, I thought. Just... Uh-huh. Well, it was interesting, but he ends up saying, like, so who owns the state, after all? And he comes out that the people who really own the state are the ones who lend it money. And these would be, like, the banks, or the bankers and so forth. And why do they own the state? Well, because when they lend the state money, the state has the money to buy more soldiers to go out and rob more people of taxes... Um, that's perpetuating the cycle, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought about this, and I thought, well, what about the people who are actually doing the robbing themselves? I mean, in a sense, he, laid, he set up this whole argument about how the state is not, um, you know, a social contract, and how the, um, you know, how the state isn't an instrument of the voters, and it's not representative and everything... But then he ends up sort of saying that, you know, it's the smoky filled rooms with these bankers who are kind of controlling everything. I was thinking, well, why don't you just say that the guys who are the soldiers and the politicians and the tax collectors, that they're the ones who are the gang, right? Because right, I mean, without them, the government state wouldn't exist either. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think the reason is that um, they had this thing about lending, they had this labor theory of value about lending for... Mm, interesting. So that was already already had a few points against it, right? The, he because he wanted, to, but in a sense, he he was a little bit tangled up with needing to demonstrate that lending money interest leads to all the bad things in the world, and I think he therefore kind of puts quite an emphasis on that. I mean, because I would say that those people are enablers of the state. If anything, I would say rather than the the, the bankers being the real state, if you like. I would say they are the enablers of the state because the real state is just the guys in costume taking your money and shooting people and, you know, calling them, uh, and using your money, right? The, the, the guys who are actually, uh, to use that lovely um, video of the onion, I don't know if you've seen it, <laughs> pouring money into the big money hole. Yeah, I just thought that was a little odd, his sort of take on it at the end there. Right. Well... F- also, another thing I just thought of with regards to the um, uh, the lending money thing, let's just say the lending money, let's just let that, let's give them that, all right? Even so, I mean, without the people stealing the money in the first place, the government would have no collateral with which to get the loans. Let's just say we've got a government, the city of London, that has, I don't even know how much they make a year in, in, in uh, taxes. Let's just say... 200 million pounds a year. I'm just throwing out a number right? yeah. in, in tax revenue. Yeah. But they're borrowing like 500 million this year. Yeah. Well, no bank would lend them that if they didn't already have the, the revenue that they were stealing from, right? So yeah. that even if we accept that the, that the lending of the money is bad, well, no bank in its right mind would lend money. If there were, if you you get what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. It's like you can't really blame the, um, in a sense, 
I understand that, you know, for example, let's say that you have an alcoholic spouse. Let's call it the guy just for simplicity, right? Uh, and he's like alcoholic and drinking himself into an early grave, whatever. And his wife keeps like agreeing that they can spend money or spending, giving him the money to buy the booze, right? I mean, you can see that she's an enabler, but it's still him who's the alcoholic. Do you know what I mean? Right, right, yeah. I mean, even if, even if um, you, you, he's got to be the primary responsibility for his actions if, in that sense, right? right? Right. It doesn't mean that it's not a bad thing for her to be enabling it, but that's sort of the way I think about the lending money to the state, that it's still, it's still the, the guy with the gun who's actually doing the, the hold-up, right? The guy well, who's it's also like, the, like this thing that in the absence of an ethical framework in society... Banks are just going to go on what makes them the most money, right? And yeah. it makes total sense to lend money to the government at the moment, right? Yeah. Like, for them, like, it makes total sense. So, on many levels, on political levels, on economic levels, so, like, it just makes sense in utilitarian terms. And if banks were, like, ethical enough to understand that, then we wouldn't have a state in the first place, because <laughs> if banks get it, everyone else would get it. Yeah. Absolutely.